Okay, and now for something completely different, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, thank you both so much. I mean, it's been absolutely wonderful. I'm really pleased to be part of this panel. Um, I'm, I'm going to be talking about um, literature. So, again, a huge step. It's, it's a lovely variation that we have. Um, I'm going to be talking about Mary Shelley and Percy Shelley, who are the focus of my research. And I'm particularly looking at how they write together and what collaboration in literature is and how that works. Um, just to kind of introduce you a little bit, I'd like to sort of tell you how I met the Shelleys. Um, I, I discovered Percy Shelley when I was 16 year old in Dublin. And I bought a, a little volume of his poetry for two euros. Got to be the best two euros I've ever spent. <laughs> One, because of the, most, the richness and wonderfulness of his poetry. And two, it's brought me here where I am now in the sort of huge study of my life. Um, and then it was several years later uh, got to be good five, six years later, I, I came and decided to do an undergraduate degree and I discovered Mary Shelley, who I'd never read before. Obviously everyone's heard of Frankenstein, uh, but a lot of people haven't kind of read the book. And I read this book and I thought, this is wonderful. And this is the wife of that poet that I love so much. And I went to see one of my lecturers and I said, I, I love this poet, I love this novelist, I want to read a book about them, what can you recommend me? She said, I, I don't think there is a book. And he paused a minute, and I can absolutely remember this so clearly, and he said, you should write that book. Um, it's taken me about 10 years, but I'm, I'm on it. I'm on it now. <laughs> um, and I, I sort of tell the story. It's kind of you know, anecdotal. It's kind of how I got here. But it's incredibly relevant to what I'm going to be talking about today, about what inspires us, what makes us write things. How does anybody ever come up with an idea in the first place? So I'm um, aware we're not all um, literature students. Why not? Um, so let me just briefly introduce you uh, to my two subjects. So first of all, we have this handsome chap. This is Percy Bysshe Shelley, great romantic poet um, from the uh, <coughs> early 19th century. Um, has sort of written some wonderful things. You might be familiar with his works, such as Ozymandias, um, Ode to the West Wind, Mont Blanc, and some of his more kind of uh, larger, more esoteric works, such as Prometheus Unbound. And this is his wife, Mary Shelley, who is obviously very famous for writing Frankenstein, um, but also has written some really wonderful, um, some other wonderful novels such as The Last Man and Valperga, which are less widely read, but um, utterly loved by those of us who are Shelley scholars. So they, um, they met, they were both very young when they met. Um, he was uh, 21 and she was 16. Uh, he was already married, but they fell in love within about two weeks ran away together and had the most extraordinary eight years together before his death. And it's in those eight years that they both write their most famous works. And I found it absolutely amazing that people aren't studying these two writers together. Um, I mean, you look at so, um, somebody like Percy Shelley is often studied with other romantic writers like Byron and Wordsworth and Coleridge and everybody's saying, oh, what are the similarities in their works? What are the differences? How are they inspiring each other? But he's not often studied with the woman who he was with, not quite every day, nearly every day for eight years, and who literally had her desk next to his desk. And they're writing the great works. The subtitle of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is The Modern Prometheus. And one of Percy Shelley's works I've already mentioned is Prometheus Unbound. I mean, this is, this is crying out to be looked at. Why hasn't this been done? And it's very interesting why it hasn't been done. Um, Sort of very briefly, there was a long period through the 19th century when people didn't really look at women writers, and uh, that's thank goodness something that we're trying to kind of um, make up for nowadays. Sort of rediscovering these romantic these female romantic writers. Um, so it's partly kind of making a gender redress, but partly I really want to get over this idea that people write things when they're sitting in a tower by themselves. And inspiration comes. That isn't how writing works. I've spoken to so many writers. I'm a writer myself, obviously, here I am. And I know that I wouldn't have done any of this by myself. So to illustrate this, I'm going gonna, um, gonna to take a case study. Um, and that's the story of Beatrice Cenci, who is a, a historical figure from 16th century Italy, um, who both of the Shelleys engaged with. And I'm going to look at sort of how they have um, very briefly, just look at how, how they've sort of engaged with her and what their dialogues might have been around her. So, 
they first come across um, this manuscript. So they, they moved to Italy in 1818. They lived there for um, six years. Excuse me. Um, they're given this manuscript by, by a friend. For those of us who don't speak Italian, it's basically the relationship of the death of the family Cenci in Rome in May 1599. And it's an absolutely brutal story, tragic story of this, this real family, this uh, tyrannical father. Um, <laughs> rather amusingly, the, this, um, this document relates his crimes as atheism was the worst of his crimes and sodomy was the least of his crimes. Um, <laughs> Most of my friends fall under that category. It's <laughs> a significant number. And it doesn't mention the, what I think we can widely all, all very widely condemn, which is that he was a murderer and a rapist. Um, very, very widely so. And his, his absolute uh, most horrendous crime was that he raped his own daughter, who was Beatrice Chenchi. She then appealed to the authorities telling them what had happened and nobody wanted to listen because he was very wealthy. He was giving money to the state, to the church, and uh, nobody was listening at this time. And ultimately she was executed for that crime. It's an absolutely tragic story. Um, and so they, they, they heard about this story, Mary Shelley and Percy Shelley, they're in Italy, and they hear this story of this, this Cenci family, of this poor girl Beatrice Cenci. And straight away they see its dramatic potential, obviously. Um, so there's this, this manuscript is given to them by, by a friend who, who owns it. It's, it's not published, it's just handwritten, 200-year-old manuscript. And they've just arrived in Italy. Mary Shelley's, well, I'm trying to learn Italian. May I please have a copy of this and I will translate it and give it back to you. So she makes this translation. And it's very interesting when we look at the manuscript, and I've been doing a lot of going back and looking at their manuscripts, you can see it's not just her writing. Um, every now and then, Percy Shelley's hand creeps in and he adds a little note. Um, every now and then you see she's left a blank. Maybe the blank's a bit too long and then he's come in and left, supplied a couple of words. Usually they're more difficult words. So there's uh, an example of a kind of tree. There's an example of a, a kind of torture. Um, not words that you're going to come across living in everyday Italy. So it's obvious that they're, they're working together on this project, leaning over each other's shoulders. What's this word? What's this word? So you can kind of build a picture up of them. Sometimes you can see them using, they're obviously using the same pen because you can see from the flow of the ink, it hasn't been changed and they're literally, he's taking it right out of her hand and, and adding something in. It's really very lovely. So they're inspired by this, this idea and perhaps to, um, Percy Shelley is really excited about it and he really wants Mary to write a play on this story. She's just published Frankenstein. It's been very successful. Even already they can work out, they can tell, good reviews are coming in, a bit of money is coming in. To give you a little bit of context, Percy Shelley had published quite a lot of poetry, quite a lot of pamphlets, and they weren't doing particularly well. He never got the recognition in his lifetime that he did just, I mean, just sort of 40 years after his death, he was already very widely uh, appreciated. So he, he never really got that. Um, that praise that he, he really deserved. Um, and also everything he was writing was poetry. He tried to write a bit of, bit of dramas here and there, but he always abandoned them. Um, there are all kinds of wonderful fragments in his diaries of things that he, he started when he always wanted to write in the moment. These are all the things I can see and feel and experience, but kind of struggled when it came to plotting something. So he said, Mary, this is an amazing story. You have to tell this poor girl's life. You should write a play or a novel. And Mary's, well, actually, I've got quite a lot to do, thank you. I've got my own novels to work on. But after a while, she starts to write a novel. And this is a novel called Matilda, um, which, which some, well, it is now called Matilda. She, she gave it a different name at the time. It was never published in her lifetime. And I think it has the change as a starting point. It goes somewhere very different. Because she writes about a father-daughter incest. But it isn't an, a brutal, aggressive tyrant. It isn't someone forcing himself upon her. She's basically asking the question, what if a good man fell in love with his daughter? And he doesn't do anything. He doesn't in any way hurt her. He's just tormented by this love that he feels but he can't express. And so this, this whole story is um, it's, it's a really wonderful book, an incredible look at uh, the inner life um, of, of a man who can't 
who can't, who can't deal with himself or what he's feeling, and then how his daughter ultimately comes to feel tainted by the love that he has for her too. I thoroughly recommend reading it. Um, so that she, she starts to work on this, but what happens a little bit later, um, it's, it's a full year after they've read this, that they're in Rome and they see a painting. And this is a painting. And this painting at the time was believed to be of Beatrice Cenci. Um, now we've kind of, we've worked a few things out that it probably can't be. Uh, but at the time, as far as they were concerned, this was her. Mm -hmm. And it's really wonderful looking at the things. I mean, Percy Shelley writes about this painting so eloquently. He would come and stare at it for days. And he talks about the sadness in her eyes, the melancholy and the lusterless. He says how somehow they've lost their life, but they're still looking at you. And with this, it, it really, it revived their interest in this story. And I, I think, I mean, I think you can see why. I think it is an extraordinary painting and uh, you can really kind of get lost in it. Um, the, the story of it was that this was actually painted um, before her execution. So she, she is in prison waiting to be summoned to the execution. Um, and Percy Shelley was so inspired about this and he writes, he writes all these letters to his friends saying, you know, it's an extraordinary woman and you can see the dignity and the sadness in her face that she had no way out of this horrendous situation of this abusive father she couldn't get away from. So she took his life and there was no sympathy, no one there to, to kind of offer her anything. And he goes again to Mary and he says, I know you're writing Matilda, but you've got to write this book. And it's really interesting, I'm, I'm kind of summarizing these things here. I'm putting these bits together from bits of her notebooks, um, bits of her diary, bits from his notebooks and bits from his letters. Uh, they don't spend enough time apart. It's really frustrating. They never write letters to each other. <laughs> Every time one of them goes away, it's wonderful. You can write and tell us what you're thinking. Uh, but in the letters we see these little hints, oh Mary, do have a think about that, do try this, make sure you bring a few pages of this when you come to see me. He really tells you, you, you should write this play, a play on the life of Beatrice Chenchi. And she says, no Percy, you should write this play. And it's wonderful, you can see the moment in, the, in their letters where she says, no, this is something you've got to do, this is something you feel so passionately about, and you've got to write it. And he, he again and again says, I, I can't. He, he, um, he writes to a friend saying, I, I thought about writing this play, but you will say I have no dramatic talent, and you're absolutely right, I don't. Again and again, he talks to Mary, he says, you have the superior talent here. And I think that's interesting, because a lot of people think of Mary Shelley as being the younger one, the one who didn't know what she was doing so well. He definitely looked at her as being the greater writer. And at last, he does start to write it, but he writes it with her. She organises the scenes, and we know this from the notes that she writes long after his death. She says how they sat down. Um, he, they, she helped him to organise the scenes to plot out the whole structure of the work. And I think it's really interesting that when he finally decides to write this, he turns to her, he says, you are the person who has the ability to make this. I can write the actual um, text, I can bring in the images, I can bring in the characterization, but you need to structure this whole story. And it is a wonderful, extraordinary play. Um, Wordsworth said it was one of the greatest play of the age, and I, I'm inclined to agree with him. Um, there is further, further use of Beatrice Cenci in Mary Shelley's writings. She talks a little bit about, um, in uh, her third novel, Valperga, which is set in 16th century Italy, she has a character called Beatrice, who does a lot of what this character does and has a lot of similarities to this person. I think she's definitely drawing on it, even though she didn't decide to do that play exactly as it had been suggested. She's inspired by it and takes that on. And now this is just, this is one example of numerous, numerous ways that the Shelleys do collaborate. And they do kind of, um, I'm talking here about collaboration of influence, but I also see um, collaboration, evidence of collaboration, actual textual, where they're supplying words for each other and helping each other kind of come up with ideas and um, structure their works. And I, I suppose, I, I, there, it is clear they collaborate. That is a thing that I think I can now say with absolute confidence. And I suppose the question I often get is, well, why does that matter? It matters because in the historical context, women have so often been written out of 
of history. Women's writing has been ignored. And the amount of books that I have read that say, Percy Shelley was a great poet, his wife is intimidated by him, she wrote a little novel. And that isn't the representation you get when you actually look at their letters or you look at how they defer to each other. Um, and also it's, they didn't come up with their own ideas. A great poet like Percy Shelley, a romantic poet, you do think of him wandering through a wood, writing as he goes. You, you, we have these romantic ideas of what a writer is, and that's just not true. If I think about all the people who have helped me in this, and, uh, and this work is um, it's structured as, as a novel. I've come a long way, and on Mary Shelley's advice, I've turned it into a novel. Um, if I think about the advice I've gotten from my supervisors, from the friends who've looked over what I've wrote and said, oh, change this, how about this? If I think about um, what I'm reading from Mary Shelley, and most of all, if I think right back to that first lecturer who said, you should give that book, write, give writing this book a go, well, it, it makes a lot of sense to me that these things are collaborations. So, in conclusion, we all write together, and also you should read Mary Shelley and Percy Shelley if you don't already, because they're wonderful. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>